Well, the tide has certainly turned in the quest to ascertain how COVID-19 originated. All the latest evidence is leading towards the theory that many of us got bagged for in the early stages, that a man-made virus created inside the Wuhan Institute of Virology infected lab researchers and leaked into the public domain. In fact, the WHO investigation found no definitive evidence of what many originally claimed, which was a crossover of the virus from bats to humans via the Wuhan wet market. And it was that lack of evidence which motivated two highly respected American scientists to examine the pure science of COVID-19 and publish their report this week in the Wall Street Journal. One of the report's authors, Professor Richard Moller, says there are two damning scientific signatures found in the genetic code of COVID-19, which have convinced both these men that this was a virus engineered in a lab. I caught up with Professor Moller in Berkeley, California, earlier this afternoon. Professor, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. You focused on two scientific aspects of COVID-19, and I want to focus on the first point that you made in your report with your colleague, firstly. COVID-19 is way more lethal than SARS and MERS. How do we know that, and why is that? Well, we know that because people die from it. Um, the reason has to do with the structure. Uh, it is, and, and this comes to both of the points that Dr. Quay and I have made. Uh, one of them is that it has this structure uh, built into the spike protein that not only attaches to the uh, vulnerable cell, but sends a signal to that cell to open up and let its viral message get in. That's a very effective way of doing things. Uh, it was uh, it was added to this to this virus with strong evidence. It was spliced in to this virus to this virus. Uh, the other reason it's so effective is that um, it has uh, been optimized. Uh, that is, there are many things when a virus reaches a human, uh, it begins to mutate. And it continues to mutate until as it gets better and better. The, the viruses that are better at attacking humans tend to be the ones that dominate, the ones that grow. And so after a few months, you have an optimized virus. This one was pre-optimized. Uh, this is a strong indication that it was optimized in the laboratory through the process of optimization known as gain of function. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's viral. It is bad. It is... It is uh, um, lethal to humans, both because of the quick way that it connects to the cell through this, uh, what we call the double SIG mechanism, uh, and also because it was pre-optimized. Okay, let's go to the first point. Are you saying that therefore it's twice as potent as what we discovered through SARS and MERS? Oh, I wouldn't say twice. I, I think it, it, it's hard to compare these things. But one of the, one of the aspects of, of, uh, of, of COVID uh, is that you can spread it for a week or two before any symptoms show up. And so that, that also increases its lethality. Making a, a, a comparison, I mean, it certainly has killed enormously more people than MERS or SARS. And the second point about it being, and excuse my lack of scientific knowledge here, but even being more potent or optimised at the beginning of the pandemic as opposed to the end, that's what you're explaining to us, aren't you? That's right. Uh, this, ha this would happen naturally. You, normally, and this was true for SARS and for MERS, uh, the virus gets into humans um, and then it begins to mutate. It mutates until... And it mutates for several months, sometimes for many, many more than that, every time getting more and more potent. However, if you wanted to make a most potent virus, what you do is you accelerate this process by putting it in a laboratory, exposing it to what we call humanized mice. These are mice whose, who, whose uh, cells have the same receptors that human cells have. Uh, and then you run it through this, the mice has a relatively short lifetime, this thing goes very, very rapidly. And by running it for several months in the laboratory, you have optimized it. So there's not much more that can change. Now in, in, in SARS, we found uh, unlike MERS, unlike SARS, that it, uh, it didn't mutate when it first came out. It had already been optimized 
for human infection. Uh, eventually, there was a minor change. Uh, the British had found the noted a slight variant, didn't really uh, it change its effectiveness very much. Uh, but, it, but, but it is clear that the, it, it departs from the precedent set by MERS and SARS, uh, MERS in 2012, SARS in 2003, both of which changed rapidly once they got into humans until they were optimized for humans. This came out pre-optimized. And what I've gleaned from your report is that this isn't too difficult to do, to scientifically change the nature of a coronavirus in the lab to optimise its impact. No, it, it, is, it is frighteningly easy to do. The insertion of this, um, of, of, of this double SIG molecule is something that had been done before by the uh, scientists at Wuhan. They had done it uh, not, not for this virus, but, but for others. They had published that. It was done about 11 or 12 times at various laboratories around the world. So this gene splicing is not hard to do. The thing that gave it away was that they used the, the, the gene slice that everybody else uses. It's very unusual to have a sequence, so the double sig sequence in, in coronavirus. In fact, the double sig sequence has never been seen in this whole class of coronaviruses. Uh, but it is the one that is the, the, the one that's most used in the laboratory. So this thing was stuck in through simple gene splicing. It doesn't leave any trace, it's, except for the fact that it's there. Uh, the, the second thing they did was the optimization, and this is gain of function. It likewise doesn't leave any special record other than this unusual feature that it is pre-optimized for humans. I guess it didn't surprise you when we heard last week that the US National Institutes of Health had partly funded similar work related to this in Wuhan and other labs in China. Well, that's been known for a year. Uh, our report, our, the, the short piece that we wrote, uh, really didn't include anything that hasn't been scientifically established, uh, in some cases over six months ago, in some cases even longer. So what we did was nothing new. We didn't do new science. What, what we did in our piece was simply say there's a lot of confusion. Every time someone says, oh, Fauci is to blame or, 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 or Daszak is to blame, and then it gets argued. So we decided to avoid all of those issues and just focus in on the hard science. So we included only these two elements, both of which are, are really damning, that show it was a manufactured uh, virus. Uh, and we didn't include any mention, mention of blame or people lying or anything like that, because we knew if we did, that's what the focus of criticism on our article would be. So by just distilling out the, the key science, uh, we, we basically made a point that, the, that this, there, there's, there's no doubt that this was a manufactured virus, manufactured out of a pre-existing uh, uh, bat coronavirus, uh, but it was so you, manipulated in the lab, yeah. and that's what made it so deadly. So finally, you are 100% convinced that this was manufactured in a lab? Uh, no, no. Uh, Steve and I would, would never say 100% for anything. Uh, he, we've talked about this. We've said this publicly. Well, we think the odds are approximately a billion to one uh, that it was manufactured in the laboratory. Well, let me just state that uh, people say the evidence is all uh, circumstantial. Well, there's some really solid science evidence. It's like a fingerprint uh, that came with the virus. Uh, the, the alternative, the, the idea that it came out of a marketplace, um, back a year ago when scientists were saying this is settled, there was solid evidence that it came from the marketplace. Solid evidence. China said they had solid evidence. They, they said, we have determined this, we have mapped it, uh, we have found the bat, and so on. They have withdrawn all of that evidence because it turned out to be false. They could not mm. substantiate it. The scientists here in the United States who said, well, you shouldn't consider alternatives because China. We, we trust China, but China has now backed off from all of those statements. And we are left with uh, enormous in information and, and, and evidence in favor of artificial. A uh, two that we talked about are the most solid scientific. There are others too, but these are enough. Uh, and for the alternative, uh, for the idea that it came from, uh, from, from an animal or from frozen food, the evidence is zero. Uh, anytime someone says, oh, we, we don't believe the 
uh, artificial origin of this. I believe that it was from uh, a marketplace, what they call the zoonotic origin. Uh, ask them, what's the evidence? Yeah. And there is none. Yeah. It's all hypothesis. Professor Richard Moller, thank you so much for your time. Very welcome.